come together as leaders and have an our uh, in our con in our audience today, and we ask for your guidance with dealing with this coronavirus issue and with all matters that we have in front of us. May we find your wisdom in the decisions that we make and the actions that we carry out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Uh, at this, uh, now I'll move on to item number three, <laughs> approval of the agenda. Have all members got to see the agenda? Uh, and if so, I'll entertain I'll a, motion a motion to approve it. Have a motion by Mr. Peters. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor of approving the agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 I also. I'll now move to item number four, the Virginia Department of Health coronavirus presentation and discussion. I think we have Dr. Cantrell here uh, who is going to speak with us on that. And I thank you very much for being here. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. Um, I guess just that they are advanced. There. Okay. So I was going to give you just a little background first. And then, yes, ma'am. Uh, talk in, uh, a little bit more about where we are right now. Uh, so we're, we have uh, an incident command structure set up in the health department, and uh, ASVDH3, telephone 877 ASVDH3 is the call number that is published across the state. And those calls that need to come to the local health department go to Robin Jackson, Delilah, or Cindy Newman. And Delilah and Cindy are here. Robin's a nurse, and Delilah's the emergency coordinator, and Cindy is their pop health manager. And they field them initially, and then if they need to kick them on up to Michelle McFerrin, who's the senior nurse manager, or myself, then uh, we field the ones that uh, may be a little different or unusual or they have specific questions about. <coughs> Uh, just a, this, I'm going to go through this really quickly, but there has been some research on the China uh, outbreak, and, and they've determined that the virus itself appeared to originate in bats. Uh, about 96% of the virus structure is similar to a coronavirus that's in bats. Uh, but what happens is, in the next slide, bats have that infection. Humans get different coronaviruses. We've known about that for some time. And usually in an intermediate host, and in the past, you've heard about swine flu, where a swine was the intermediate host between a virus, a flu virus in humans and another flu virus, and they kind of, the, the DNA of the viruses mix in, a, in an intermediate host. Right now, they don't know the intermediate host for this particular one. But uh, we do know that coronaviruses are around all the time. So when we order respiratory virus panels, which we're asking hospitals and healthcare providers to order on people with symptoms of the novel coronavirus that contains a coronavirus panel. Kids get coronavirus. Common cold is often caused by four different strains of coronaviruses. But in the past, we've had two more severe uh, coronaviruses, the one that caused the SARS outbreak in 2003, and then MERS was the Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome, which actually the intermediate host there turned out to be camels, and so people were getting infected from camels with that one. That was 2012 or 13, I think, somewhere along in there. And now we have the SARS-CoV-2, which is what the novel coronavirus is referred to now. It is spread through coughing, sneezing, and close personal contact. We think it's largely droplet spread, so when people actually sing, we, you know, also causes a fair amount of droplets, and so... You know, when we were talking about my church service yesterday, we were talking about how far apart should be if you're six feet apart from the people on either side of you, but you're in, there's somebody in the pew right in front of you, and you're singing, and you're sick, sick, that's not six feet. And so ultimately, we ended up not having our services yesterday for the, and for the next couple of weeks. But those are some singing and shouting, as well as coughing and sneezing, and pers close personal contact from hand to hand or hand to surface can uh, transmit it that we call it the incubation period, so how long from the time you're infected with the virus is it until you begin to show symptoms of the infection, and that's anywhere from two to 14 days. With this current novel coronavirus, the average based on China and so far in this country has been five. Some people, it's even as specific as 5.2 days, so uh, roughly five days, although the range is two to 14. And there's still a lot to learn about it. Uh, so I, we've all been listening to the news, so I think it's not a surprise what's going on with it. The symptoms that are characteristic are there in the center, fever or cough or a sensation of shortness of breath. Uh, most of the cases, particularly in China's experience in younger people where mild illnesses were characteristic, 
You may, and about four out of five people, you may have heard of the Diamond Princess folks that were screened. And in those cases, there were a fair number of people who had no symptoms at all who tested positive for it. So there's a, still some underlying concern about how many people could be infected who don't test positive, and that's not completely well worked out yet. Severe cases statistically are about one in five, and those typically are older people. Uh, and again, we talked about symptom onset, two to 14 days. So that's the total number of cases in, so far, uh, almost 175,000. China was the epicenter until the last few days, and now Europe slash Italy has become the epicenter. And the United States, this was as of this morning, right? Uh, Delilah updated this, I think, just today. Uh, 3,800 cases, 69 deaths, 73 recovered, and 36, 64 active cases. Seriously limited by lack of access to testing. So I think everybody understands that we don't know how many cases there are right now in this country because a lot of people who probably meet some criteria and need to be tested just have trouble accessing the test. So what the case fatality rate is, which how many people die over what's the total number of cases, uh, it's hard, unless you don't know what the denominator is for the total number of cases, you don't know how many asymptomatic carriers because we don't have widespread, we're only testing people who are symptomatic, we're not testing people with no symptoms. So it's hard to know what the denominator is and therefore it's hard to calculate a case fatality rate at this point. But statistic, or based on China's experience, is said to be about 2%. <clears throat> Most people have fever. Uh, some and cough, those are the top two symptoms, and then the third one is shortness of breath, but you see here that fatigue, sputum production, muscle aches, sore throat, headache, and the percentage of people that complain to those. But the screening criteria for testing for the health department tests are fever or cough or shortness of breath, uh, and then contact with someone uh, who's a confirmed case of COVID-19. This is uh, some data from the China experience, just looking at uh, the median age of people infected there at 51, with a range of age two days to 100 years of age. Most of the deaths were in people 60 and up, and in fact, in one study, which is not reflected on this slide, there were no deaths in people under 30. So younger people tend to have milder illness and tend to have some of them, you can see here, 2.4% less than 19 can have you know, some more severe symptoms, but they didn't have, they didn't die from their infection. And it's one of the messages that I've been sharing with, you know, some of the folks in schools, the younger kids in school, especially the seniors who want to do senior trips or who want to do some get-togethers, is that anybody who trips, the, those are younger, healthier people who want to do cruises and go to the beach in Florida or you know, Disney World and Universal Studios, Studios, I think, are closed now, so that's less of an attraction. But they're the ones who are going to go, and if they get exposed and get infected, they're probably not going to be very sick. And you remember the incubation period, 2 to 14 days. A lot of these trips are 5 to 7 days long. So depending on when they got exposed on their trip, when they get, they're probably, they may not be sick until they're back in our community. You know, or they may be getting sick as they come back in our community. They may be getting sick on the bus rides home from these places or in the cars where there's four and five kids piled in the car going to the beach. And so everybody in the car then is exposed and then they come back. And I know our family, my family, and a lot of your families probably have several generations that are pretty close and they get together with grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. And some of those people could be at risk, that vulnerable population who does get sicker and who can even die from this. So as we think about this as a community, I think it's really important to think of it as we're all in this together. And we, what's good for one has got to be good for everybody, and what's not good for one is maybe not good for everybody. And so, you know, I'm in that age group where <laughs> I would be high risk, but my kids are not, you know. And so they're worried about coming to see me because they know if they're going to, be sick and bring something to me, they're going to get over it, but I might be a lot sicker. And I think we all have to think like that, that we are, this is a community effort that takes us all working to try to keep everybody healthy. Because um, the male to female, not a whole lot of difference. I don't know why that's different. I didn't see any explanation of it. 80% were mild, 13% severe, and 6% critical. And again, the age isn't up there, but it's definitely skewed by age with milder and younger and more serious and older. 
Uh, the duration of illness is an average of two weeks with the worst symptoms beginning in the second week. Uh, and then uh, people who've been really sick have been sick for three to six weeks. Uh, the onset of the severe disease is about a week in, from the onset of infection. Um, and death occurred anywhere from two to eight weeks. Uh, how long people shed the virus who've had it has been interesting. Uh, some of the studies from uh, China said the average was about 20 days. So there's still a little bit of work going on in terms of if you get it and you get over it. For at least seven days, there, right now I think the advice is for at least seven days after you've completely recovered that you should continue to isolate. But there's still some work to be done in that area too to know the sicker people who were in ICU and the patients who died, patients who died had virus up till their death. If it was four to six weeks from the time they developed symptoms, they still had virus. Uh, the, the more severe cases continue to show virus for much of that severe illness. So um, if you're over it and healthy, right now they're saying about seven days after you completely recover, you're probably free of the virus. <clears throat> this didn't show up very well, but there's most countries, 140 some countries out of 200 have the disease now. This is on the CDC or WHO website. 157 now. 157 now. Okay. There's like 200, just slightly over 200 countries. So three fourths of the countries are reporting, and that shows that uh, you know that where China was the epicenter with 80,000 cases, new cases now are more occurring in Europe and especially in Italy. And I don't know if you all have looked at any of those uh, recordings, interviewing physicians that are taking care of patients in Italy in the hospitals. It's sobering to listen to what they're having, the kind of decisions they're having to make. Uh, so current risk for Virginians, uh, as of noon today, I think the number went up to 51 in it's, Virginia. And it's 49 jurisdictions now. 49 jurisdictions in the United States. The only one that's still not reporting anything is West Virginia. West Virginia, yeah, the last one. Uh, so um, the, the potential public health threat, I don't have to tell anybody, is really significant. We don't have a vaccine yet for this. There's probably 12 months off before there will be one available. And to anyone's knowledge right now, there's not a good antiviral to treat this with. There are a couple that are being tested, but they haven't made it through the testing you know, trials to know if they're the risk and the benefit, you know, if it's worth it. So uh, it's very different from the flu uh, because we have vaccine. We have uh, six antivirals now to treat people with flu and we don't have that with this particular infection. So keeping abreast of what's going on in our community uh, and uh, as much as we can, but again, the limitation of not being able to test and not know if there's more disease in our community than we know about, which I feel like there probably is, but how far into our communities the, you know, the reach is right now, this is just really hard to know because there's testing is hard to access. The button. There we go. So uh, actually the public health screening now is occurring at 13 airports in the United States. There are level three travel advisories, which is just don't travel if it's not absolutely necessary to uh, a bunch of, uh, of countries, including all of Europe and now the uh, United Kingdom and Ireland have been added to it. Uh, so there's those four, I thought I updated that slide, but I must not have saved it, sorry. And uh, level two travel advisory in Japan uh, still. So right now with no cases known yet in Southwest Virginia, the focus of public health has been to uh, contain the infection. So we're really working hard to identify cases and then uh, make it sure that, have them tested and then if the case is positive then that person isolates until they're over the infection plus seven days. And then we identify all their contacts within their period of infectiousness, which is 14 days prior to when they had their onset of symptoms. So we sit with that person or over the phone and get wherever, every place they've been and every person they've been in contact with for any length of time in the 14 days before they develop symptoms. And those people would be quarantined. And then we had been doing some uh, quarantine of people who have returned from countries of high risk, uh, particularly China, and that was six weeks ago. And we had completed three 14-day monitorings of folks who had come back from China, uh, and they were fine. So they've completed that. So uh, 
Right now, the focus is on case identification, isolation of cases if they're positive, and contact tracing. So we are just chasing folks who are, you know, calling with concerns to try to clarify whether their symptoms are compatible, where they may have come in contact with somebody with COVID-19. We have criteria. I can't remember if this slide is in here or not. The criteria that we're using for testing through the health department. The health department does have access to tests. So there are no point of care tests right now. So unlike a flu or a strep test where you go to your doctor's office, they swab your throat, 20 minutes later you know the result. There's not a test like that anywhere for this infection. Uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center and a couple other places, VCU, have tests. They can, they can do the same tests that we do at DCLS and that's done at LabCorp. It takes six hours to run the test, but you have to be a high complexity lab under CLIA. And um, so our limitation right now is just couriering it. The DCLS lab's in Richmond, so the specimens are collected here. LabCorp from this area uses Burlington, North Carolina. So it takes six hours once it gets there. Uh, DCLS runs two shifts a day of doing these tests. One starts at 8 in the morning, one starts at 2 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. And they also test on Saturday and Sunday uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning. So when we, and we can call the courier. But our criteria for testing are someone with fever or cough and shortness of breath who's been a contact of a person with confirmed COVID-19 infection. Or someone with hospitalized with pneumonia symptoms and other causes have been excluded. And, or long-term care residents because of the devastation that we saw from the long-term care facility in Seattle where so many people died from that infection in Kirkland, uh, which is just one of the little communities in Seattle. So long-term care and ALF folks with symptoms and flu is ruled out, which you can test for flu in 30 minutes. So once you've done that and it's negative, then there may be a candidate for COVID-19 testing. Nursing homes, long-term care facilities are being advised to limit and restrict visitation. They're also restricting movement of patients from one facility to another. Most of them that we've talked to are having patients eat their meals in the room and not gather in the dining halls to minimize their contact with each other. All the community groups, I know my church goes to the nursing home and wise once a month, the first Sunday of the month, and does church service there, but all of the community groups that come in are also, those are no longer happening either. So just trying to keep this infection. And then there are staff in all the long-term care facilities. We've reached out to all of them, are screening their employees. They all come in through one door, one entry. They get their temperature and symptoms reviewed as they enter. And midway through the shift, they get it again, and they get it again before they go home. And so they're trying their best, I think, really, to keep, keep it out of long-term care facilities. Dr. Cantor, have there been, how many tests have been administered in Southwest Virginia? Do you have any idea? I don't, because so many of them, I mean, we, uh, Southwest Virginia, of course, the definition for the region, when you hear that on the Rona, news, it's from right. Roanoke over to Appomattox, up to Covington, Clifton Forge, and then down to Lee County. So but it's a big area. In your hands-on sort of area, are you aware of any tests that have actually been We haven't done, we haven't, no, we've had nobody. We, Actually, we thought we had somebody last week, and then the criteria changed while we were working with this person, and so uh, we haven't sent any up. So we've literally tested nobody here. No, but LabCorp and Quest and the primary care, so anybody else that doesn't, lab clinicians can test anybody they feel like it's indicated for, and they send so us through LabCorp. So it's a third discretion, right? Yeah, third yeah. Third. So there's been several tested that way. It's just that they only have like three or 400 kits in Richmond, and they mm -hmm. have the outbreak over in Peninsula. And then they have, they've had 10 cases, I think, in one or two health districts. So they're trying to hold on until they get more test kits to the areas where they know there's actually ongoing community transmission. When do you anticipate test kits being readily available for, for anybody? We I mean, hear you know. every day or two that there's going to be more, just like we're hearing you know, nationally that there's going to be more. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're optimistic that there is going to be more and that testing will be liberalized. But there, Restricting hours to kind of really high-risk populations like nursing homes where we really want to be able to get on those quickly. Understand. And where people in the community have other options to go get tested at their primary care or call it by calling ahead of time and letting them know they're coming in or they're interested. 
Do a lot of the primary care providers around here have Not testing? Not all of them. We've contacted all of them. Most of them do, but there are a few who haven't trained their staff and don't have personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. And so there were a few. So when they call ahead, they may be told, you know, we can't do it in our office, but here's where you can go, an urgent okay. care or a hospital ER. And then they should also call those ahead of time and make sure they know they're coming in. Thank you. Really There's a shortage of N95 masks, as you know, and a lot mm -hmm. of the primary care offices didn't really have people fit tested or have a stock of them when this started, and they really quickly got depleted. And so, uh, you know, that's part of the problem is even the ones who would be willing to do it are now in a position where they probably can't get the masks. And so, right. Right. <laughs> there are some alternatives that the CDC has published in uh, interim guidance for personal protective equipment where you put them just a regular surgical mask on the patient and you wear a surgical mask yourself and gloves and the eye protection and they're saying you can that's good because it's droplet spread and so that keeps the patient from generating droplets toward you and keeps you from generating droplets blocking the droplets that might make it to you by collecting them on your mask. Uh, I just had a con couple conversations on my drive over here with some practices making sure they train their staff on how to take that off after it might be contaminated so they don't risk contaminating their hands with their PPE as they remove it. Because donning and doffing, putting on and taking off PPE is also a risk. So there's a lot of training that goes in with staff and uh, making sure they use So if this thing spikes in the next week, our providers may not even be able to administer tests. I mean, is that work? Well, I think they're, uh, so the hot, some of the hospitals are gearing up to do it. I know Norton Community's got a tent set up outside and okay. they're diverting everybody to it to screen and test there. Uh, and I expect we have some tents uh, in the STIP tents, stabilization and treatment and place tents and, that are stored around Wise and Scott County that are really regional resources. So, <coughs> but I believe a few years ago, the Far Southwest Hospital Preparedness Coalition bought the hospital's tents. So I think a lot of them probably have them already. It's just whether they're choosing, how they're choosing to use well, them. Well, I understand. That's the safest way for the personnel to administer the test is, is in that sort of Put environment. Put your PPE on and, right. and then have people not enter your hospital. Exactly. So that's one option. If you have another way, like if you could designate an urgent care area that's just for that and then save your ER for chest pain and things mm -hmm. that are not in and resembling the flu, there's, there's some other ways to approach it too. Um, okay, so I talked about surveillance uh, and a diagnostic test developed. That's the test for COVID-19. Uh, there is no medication to treat uh, this particular virus yet. Uh, that's, uh, there are a couple that are being looked at and uh, the vaccine is in the phase one development, which phase one means you prove that it's safe and you have to prove that it's safe, that takes about three months and before you prove that it works, because you can't start testing it for efficacy until you know that it's a safe thing to give to people. So it's gonna take roughly 12 months, at least 12 to 18 months to get a vaccine. Uh, and I don't know what's going on with the Germany vaccine development, if they're really ahead of that curve or not. I've just heard a little bit in the news, but I haven't seen anything in the literature. Did y'all? <coughs> Uh, so we are, we've reached out to the clinical providers, we've reached out to uh, other state agencies and our community partners, FQHCs. Uh, many of the FQHCs and primary care providers didn't, hadn't done fit testing and so we're trying to step our fit testing up to help them to get a few people fit tested and we have some train the trainer fit testers if they want to order their own little hoods and get their own Vitrex and we have folks who can train them how to fit test their own folks. Uh, the trouble is, if you don't have the N95 now, it's going to be a few weeks or months before you get it. So fit testing is really not as big of a deal at this point until we get the mask. Uh, then uh, we're sending out emails to, uh, with guidance for clinical providers. The commissioner's sending them out. We're sending them out locally, uh, as well as to other community partners. I did uh, have a talk with uh, one of the DSS directors on my drive over, too, about uh, He's going to try to help us organize. I have eight jurisdictions with DSS directors, so hopefully later this week or early next week we'll get on a phone call with DSS uh, to just talk about things they can do when they're doing CPS complaints going into homes and also to help us when we have people on isolation and quarantine who need groceries or something from the pharmacy or, you know, we don't have enough staff to 
help out with some of that. So I'm hoping we can identify some resources to help with that. Um, and then we're again using the epidemiological interventions that we know prevent the spread of respiratory diseases like the contact tracing that I talked about and identification of contacts and quarantining them, monitoring them, and containment. And then uh, there's some resources on these slides and copies of press releases. The 877-ASK-BDH3 is the call center. Some of those calls will be handled there. Some of them, if they're you know, about concerns about people sick or something, they may refer them on to the first three names I showed you on the first slide in the district or the county where the person's located. Uh, and then we're doing targeted outreach to colleges and universities, DOE, emergency management, and hospital and healthcare, working with them, several calls with those different folks. Um, so uh, there's uh, information on the VPH website, and when you pull up the website, each one of these has a little plus or minus arrow to the right on the end of it. So if you just click on the plus, it drops down other resources under about coronavirus disease, travelers, information for travelers, healthcare professionals, businesses, education, general health, uh, home and, and family, uh, community and faith-based organizations. So there's more than, I don't know if the next slide has the rest of them on there or not, I don't think it does, no. But there's several links and that's on the external website, vdh.virginia.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, and you can pull up resources that you might need for any of the groups that you may be working with. Um, so we talk about community mitigation, and so I originally said right now we're in the containment phase, and then mitigation typically starts when you have community spread, so you have person-to-person -person community, so a person-to-person -person spread. So right now when there's a case identified, they try to identify whether this person had traveled to an area that was high risk, or whether they had been in contact with somebody who had COVID-19 confirmed. And when you start finding people that don't have any, either one of those, they can't identify, you know, they didn't just get back from China or off the cruise ship or been around anybody, then that's community transmission. So they're getting it and they don't know where, where they were exposed to it. And that's when mitigation historically kicks in. And mitigation just are, is kind of some actions you can take in various uh, settings to reduce the spread of the virus in the community. The virus is there and you want to just tap it down until it doesn't spread as fast in the community as it would if you weren't doing these things. <clears throat> uh, so the local factors, I'll just leave this slide with you. You'll have copies of these. You can't just get blurry or it's not. My eyes doing that. It's a little blurry. Okay. Uh, so some of the factors that you look at for mitigation are the level of community transmission, the number and type of outbreaks you're having, and the impact of the outbreaks on healthcare, on your healthcare system, and the epidemiology and surrounding jurisdictions. So really, you know, of those four, you could feel pretty good about where we are right now, but the concern is that, you know, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know if there's people out here with mild disease that don't have tests and haven't been tested. We also, uh, you know, we know that uh, Sullivan County, Tennessee has had a confirmed case. So most of the data you'll see on the Virginia map doesn't include any of the counties that are adjacent to us in Kentucky and West Virginia and Tennessee that may have had cases. And I pointed that out to them because that was some of the criteria for restricting visitors in nursing homes. And it looks like from their map that there's not a case yet in Southwest Virginia, which is true. Charlottesville However, just had a case. Yeah, Charlottesville's in Central Virginia. That's not Southwest. No, that's not Southwest. We still, as of noon, we didn't have any cases in South. In how they define Southwest, we stopped at Roanoke, Allegheny, Covington, Clifton Forge, and goes over to Lynchburg and Appomattox and comes down. But we know, I know, we know from the hepatitis A at McAllister's Deli a few months ago in Kingsport. And the hepatitis A that was at Cheddar's at Exit 7 in Bristol, I can't tell you how many dozens of people from Tazewell and Dickinson and McCannon and Wise County came to our health department saying, I ate at McAllister's those four days. That was the window of exposure. And those three or four days was all at Cheddar's. <coughs> so we don't stay home a lot, but we have to do. And we need to now. But, uh, but so we have folks who've gone to the Tri-Cities to do it regularly for medical appointments, for just any number of things. But uh, so 
I don't want us to get too confident. And the other thing, I'm going to skip on down and go to the next slide because you can read this later. But we can very quickly overwhelm our healthcare capacity here. We've been medically underserved in these eight jurisdictions that I have. For the, I came to practice here in 1983. I'm old. And we've been had a shortage of primary care providers, a shortage of specialists. We, I have a list that I brought with me today that I updated this week of every hospital in far southwest Virginia and how many ICU beds they have. That doesn't mean they can staff them because when they start seeing this infection, they're also going to have healthcare professionals sick and they're also going to have probably nurses out sick. And so what they have and can staff today may look really different after this hits How many healthcare professionals do you have sick now? In, in this, this area? Yeah, in that red. I don't, I don't know. In the outlying area where it's, you know, we have, you know, do you know of many cases? I don't know of any here that are sick with this. That's I know we've seen a couple that were reported. I can't remember where that was. It wasn't in Southwest Virginia, but uh, there have been a couple of healthcare professionals that are reported to be sick. It gets to be really, I mean, I don't, it gets to be really uh, interesting. My daughter is a surgeon in a medical center in Nebraska. That's one of the biocontainment units for this. So this is where the people that got off the Diamond Princess came to their major, it's where Ebola patient, patients went a few years ago, and that's where these people are going. And they've told them when, when it gets to be really widespread, if you're one of those people, healthcare professionals who are sick, but you're only mildly sick, and this is in the CDC guidelines too, that if you're all you're doing at work is taking care of people who've got the same thing you have, come on to work. Uh, so, you know, right now they're not saying that because the healthcare professionals are still working with people they don't know that they're diagnosed yet. And if it gets like it is in Italy, that's what's going on in Italy right now. When you don't have enough healthy doctors to take care of people, if you're a healthy doctor, nurse practitioner, and you're healthy enough to work, and everybody you're taking care of has the same thing you have, they're needing you there to help. So we don't want to get to that place. So what I'm going to say is, normally mitigation factors you don't step, you don't start until you have community spread. But there's some good data from 1918, actually. This is the swine flu, right? This is Spanish flu. 1918, yeah, 1918, the swine flu, Spanish flu in 1918. So uh, Philadelphia was one of the early cities that identified swine flu. And they waited until they had community transmission to start kicking up their social distancing. I don't know what they called it back then, but, you know, um, canceling major meetings and, and uh, doing the things that we're doing nationally. And you see their mortality spike in the yellow there. And then about the same time, I don't know if this corner works or not. It does. Does it? Yeah. yeah. Right there is St. Louis. So here's when, you know, some of the first uh, social distancing was enacted in uh, Philadelphia. And the first case was in Philadelphia in September 17th. And they didn't start social distancing until October the 3rd. Mm -hmm. And by then they get this big spike. And then uh, this is St. Louis who started their first case. On, on October the 5th, but they started social distancing two days later. And they were able to, this is what they call that flattening the curve, mm -hmm. that they were able to slow down the transmission so that overall the same number of people might have been sick. I don't really know how much difference there was here but and here, but they didn't overwhelm their healthcare system. They had beds and healthcare professionals adequate to uh, you know, better manage them. This is the projection from the CDC on this outbreak, and they're saying that, you know, based on the rate of rise of cases now, that if nothing was done, cases with no protective measures, that's what the curve they're projecting would look like. But if we went ahead and implemented these mitigation strategies that we're talking about, we, they would hope to be able to flatten that curve down to something like that, where this line here representing healthcare system capacity might not be exceeded as much. So stopping, canceling school. So kids are not gathering at school, canceling meetings. CDC said 50, the governor yesterday said 100. He's now said 50 for Peninsula, <coughs> where they know they have community transmission. Uh, and then, you know, looking at what we're doing in our faith community and looking at what we're doing with, you know, practices for sports that are not school-based or for, 
meetings, social meetings, I don't know about, you know, like Kiwanis and things like that. Just is, are these meetings something that we need to do right now? Is there another way to have them for people to call into them? That's some of the issues that I think communities, as community members and as thinking about not just us and what we need to do and want to do, but what's the impact on the people we go home to? Are there people that we visit or go home to that are going to be, if we got it, could make them really sick or even you know, put them in the hospital or ICU? So that's how I think we have to think about this. <coughs> this is a handout that's on our website. And did you bring copies today? Um, we did bring copies. Okay, so this is the. Okay, so these are mitigation strategies for different uh, different environments and different groups. This one is for home and family, so it just says, you know, it does say if there's no community transmission at this point, and then minimal to moderate, and then substantial community transmission. But I think when we think about what's happened in the past, you know, I think implementing as many of these measures before we're in the middle of community transmission may help everybody in our community stay healthy through this, or healthy longer. So this is home and community, home and family. What am I doing? This is work site suggestions, same sort of format. These are schools and child cares. Uh, community and faith-based organizations. And there's separate handouts on their website too, I think, for each one of these if you don't want. And this is assisted living and long-term care facilities, uh, things that they can do to reduce their risk of introducing. And most of them are doing those already too, even though we don't have community transmission. And this is healthcare settings and providers uh, for outpatient and for uh, urgent care and inpatient. Uh, okay, so and this is just kind of a summary of, you know, Again, usually at this level, none or minimal transmission in the community, we'd be doing primarily confinement, and we are really focused on confinement. But I think it's also time to bring in some of these other measures to try to do the social distancing and reduce our group meetings and do everything we can to protect our whole community. Uh, who's at risk has been asked pretty often, and this is the list of the CDC. So they talk about elderly people being over 60, and uh, or anybody with underlying health conditions that puts them at risk, and this is the list of underlying health conditions that put people at risk. So you see blood disorders like sickle cell or on blood thinners, uh, lots of people on blood thinners. Uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, however your doctor defines it, there's five stages of that. Certainly people on dialysis, but people with poor kidney function who aren't quite on dialysis yet. Uh, would fall there. Chronic liver disease, no matter whether it's called from caused from obesity and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or alcohol related or hepatitis related. There's lots of ways you can get liver disease. Most common being Hep B and uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, compromised immune systems, immunosuppression. Uh, you folks on medications, disease modifying drugs for arthritis or ulcerative colitis, bowel disease, or chemotherapy or radiation therapy for cancer. Current or recent, within the past two weeks, pregnancy is a risk. Uh, endocrine disorders, particularly diabetes. Generally, people who are on you know, a thyroid pill a day is not as high a risk as people with diabetes, but technically it's part of endocrine disorders. Metabolic disorders, which are inherited metabolic disorders, uh, and mitochondrial disorders, those are genetic things people are born with. Uh, heart disease, um, congenital heart disease, congenital heart failure, coronary disease, lung disease, especially in this area, you know, pneumoconiosis, uh, co-workers pneumoconiosis, COPD, asthma, those are all, and we have so many people that fit these categories that, and we have Dickinson County has zero ICU beds, zero negative pressure beds, um, no private HEPA rooms, no ventilators, so you have Dickinson County Critical Access Hospital really not being able to address this for this county. So we're looking at Norton or Pikeville or wherever people choose to go in the region uh, for care. But uh, Norton has six, is that right, Norton Community? Six ICU beds? Yes. And eight negative pressure rooms, one in the ER, and the rest of them up on the floor. And uh, I don't have the vent count there. I know they have vents. And they just got some extra vents from the far southwest uh, hospitals, and they actually have 70, 98 ventilators in all 
uh, from Galax to you know to Norton or Lonesome Pine, which is a lot of ventilators. But if you don't have staff, mm -hmm. respiratory therapists and nurses who are familiar, then having the ventilator and the ICU beds and the negative pressure rooms is you know uh, some help, but not as much as you like to have the whole package. Uh, and then neurologic and uh, neurodevelopmental conditions. Folks, you know, you know, adults and children with cerebral palsy who have trouble coughing, you can't clear secretions well. Um, strokes, people who also have, you know, a lot of people after a stroke have trouble coughing and swallowing and aspirating. Those are folks who getting pneumonia with this is a real serious condition. Uh, so you've heard this before. I can't tell you how important it is. Uh, certain basic prevention measures are certainly wash your hands with soap and water. There's no hand sanitizer, but I was at the store, then you buy that soap and water works, you know, so as long as, so I'm just stocking up on bars of soap as much as I am looking for hand sanitizer. I'm not, not looking for it, but it's just not there. And so I'm making sure I got plenty of soap and making sure it's handy and making sure when you wash your hands that you I don't sing the little happy birthday song twice, counting to 20. I, you, you really have to do the 1,001, 1,000, so because most people count too fast to 20, so there's probably about 15 seconds, but wash your hands, rub them, you know, wet them, soap on them, rub them together, wash the backs of your hands each time, wash your thumbs, okay, wash under your fingernails, and then just rub your hands front and back, get your hands really clean, take the whole 20 seconds, and then when you rinse your hands, this came from my brief introduction to surgery, which I knew immediately I was not going to be a surgeon. Uh, <laughs> is you put your hands under the water with the clean part up so that if you have your hands down like this and you're rinsing these clean hands, soap off your clean hands, if you didn't get your wrist too well, then you're putting water right over the dirty <coughs> wrist that's going to wash right down on your hands. So if you can hold your hands up a little bit and rinse them this direction so that the clean rinses onto the dirty instead of the dirty rinsing onto the clean, then you won't negate your efforts to try to wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer when you have it and it's available. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with your unwashed hands. The six feet, avoid close contact. That social distancing, I've seen a couple places where they said three feet, but six feet, two meters is what's recommended. And two, there's 39, 39.36 inches in a meter, so roughly six and a half feet is two meters. So keep that distance from other people. This room is too close. Uh, Y'all are too close. Yeah. I don't know if you've watched TV lately, but all the commentators have spread out. Uh, and there's, uh, avoid close contact with people who are sick. Cover your cough. Cough etiquette is so important. Don't cough in your hands. Cough in your sleeve if you don't have a tissue. If you have a tissue, then use the tissue and then throw it away. And my brother asked me, if you cough in your sleeve, you're supposed to bump elbows. And I'm like, you know, He's worried about that. He worries a lot. Uh, and then, by all means, if you're sick, stay at home. Uh, yeah, we still have flu in the community. One of the rule outs for COVID-19, the first test is checking for flu A and B. There is, a, I was talking last night to one of the epis from up the road, uh, and there's flu influenza AH1N1 appears to have mutated a little bit this year. And so even people who took the vaccine are seeming to get H1N1 flu. And so it's really important to make sure if you're concerned about COVID-19 that they do test you for flu A and B because uh, she was saying they were actually seeing a few more cases than they expected to from AH1N1 and suspected. We know that B Victoria mutated. So they chose the vaccine strains for the flu shot right now for next year. And what can happen is in the intervening months, the virus can change a little bit, and then there's two strains of B and two strains of A in most vaccines, and one of the Bs did change a little bit, but they've proven it's happened, and they're suspecting that maybe one of the A's changed a little bit this year, too. It probably still works to reduce the risk of serious complications from the flu, but people are getting it. They seem to get over it a little quicker. Uh, be vigilant. It's rapidly, everything is incredibly rapidly changing. Uh, there's a lot more to learn about where the virus came from, whether it, how it's transmitted, the whole droplet spread, could any of it remain in the air, airborne? You know, uh, that's been raised, it's not been proven that it does, but uh, that's still, I think, a bit of an open question and uh, risk of transmission. Again, promoting respiratory infection <coughs> and respiratory prevention uh, programs in your home <coughs> and every place you visit. 
uh, ask people, you know, we sent out or did in advance for our last <coughs> church service, if you're sick, please don't come to church. If you need communion, we'll have a healthy elder bring it to your house. Uh, and, you know, we'll put a mask on and, you know, I mean, there's just ways to do it. Just be creative and think about ways to help sick people stay home and protect them. <coughs> Updates you can find on, actually, there's one WMF thing, www.mph.virginia.gov slash coronavirus. That's updated every day at noon with cases. And right below the case number is a map with every locality that has reported a case and then how many cases it's blue and the darker blue it is the more cases they have and the legend is there. <coughs> uh, for community partners, other state agencies and private businesses, uh, healthcare professionals and offices, have an emergency operations plan. Have look out, bring out your pan flu plan if you had one and look at it and your continuity of operations. What are your mission essential functions that you have to do and what can you put off for now or do differently? For example, at the health department, WIC uh, folks are getting phone calls to recertify them so they don't have to come in, and they can get a month's worth of WIC services through a phone recertification without coming in for now. Uh, we're going to be cutting back our <coughs> clinic hours so that we can fo focus on mission essential functions and focus on community outreach and education and uh, this. Um, they uh, work closely with us and on containment strategies. If you have any questions, if you have our contact information, please give us a call, and we'll be glad to kind of work with you. There's still a lot of unknowns in this, but some of it is, uh, you know, just thinking about different ways to do things that keep you safe and the community safe and involves less <coughs> personal contact with each other. And again, maintaining situational awareness through trusted sources. Our website, both the Cumberland Plateau Health District website and Luna Wisco, we have one person updating both of them. One of the things he's posting now are the World Health Organization myth busters, things that are being published that are inaccurate about this. And so those are updating. He has them on it. I don't know how they do this, but he has them on a timer or so. Different ones come up every few hours. So, uh, so and then they remain there. So uh, there's resources out there. World, World Health Organization, CDC, BDH, uh, all have re reliable information. Facebook, not so much, uh, although we do put these on Facebook to try to counter some of the stuff that's out there. <coughs> Oops, what did I just do? Yeah, and then, yeah, non-pharmaceutical interventions. We've talked about hand washing, social distancing, and diligent cleaning <laughs> of doorknobs, light switches, these things. Your, your cell phone, one of the things that was one of the dirtiest things they found were people's cell phones where one out of six were able to culture fecal bacteria from their cell phone surface. So taking your cell phone out of its cover and cleaning your cover and your phone itself every day or so. We have sanitary wipes in the cars. We wipe down gear shifters and steering wheels and you know the controls on the door. Think, think about all the things everybody touches in the office, the phones, the fax machines, all that stuff. Keep it wiped down with antibacterial. <coughs> I think that's the last one. It's not blocking me now. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, there is no antiviral treatment yet. Uh, and their the vaccine is probably at least 12 months off. Unless Germany's got something they've been working on that we're just all learning about now. <coughs> Again, the source that um, one uh, missing link, uh, this, that was the picture that's the Swine uh, in the first SARS CoV 1, it was a cat, it was a civet cat that was the, the missing link to transmitting it. And uh, so there is some concern that pets, and one of the things we tell people who are quarantined or isolated is if they have inside cats and dogs, that they should separate themselves from them too, um, because we just don't know enough about whether those animals can be infected and then transmit it too. So we instructed the folks that we've been talking to not to be not to have any contact with their cats and dogs. Uh, pathogens and virulence of, as this virus evolves, how does it change? Flea viruses change, several viruses change as they get transmitted from person to person. So what that may look like, we could pray that it gets less virulent because that does happen occasionally, but it can also get more virulent. Uh, and then the role of aerosol transmissions in non-healthcare settings, so and the role of fecal-oral transmission. 
uh, from poor hand washing is another concern. Um, viral, how long people shed the virus, they're still working on that. We, you know, know that people who are really sick shed for longer than 20 days. Average shedding time was what they found in China from the people that were hospitalized. The people who died of it shed it the whole time. And uh, right now, I think yesterday I saw seven days after you've completely recovered, they may be considering you no longer infectious. Um, and then asymptomatic infections is still a concern. There's been a little bit published about seasonality, maybe when the temperatures get warmer, this will go away. But there's some of it in Australia, and it's summer there now, so it's kind of hard to make to know what to make of whether how much of an effect you know spring and summer is going to have on them. Okay, there's our uh, contact information and resources for your education and reading pleasure. And then we'll try this thing. You mentioned quarantine. You learn to contact with the person that's infected. So if you were a spouse, say, say, uh, say a husband has COVID-19 and he lives with the spouse or wife, the date that she became, the most frequent date that she became in contact with him was 14. So when we were getting to the time of the children, we took their, uh, we took the date they left China, Minus 13 hours because they're 13 hours ahead of us in time zone, plus 14 days. To calculate the first day of their uh, of their confinement or quarantine, and then the end of it. And any day that's a partial day up to the end of the day. Uh, 14 days for somebody to say. When you uh, get exposed to virus, you've got the virus. After seeing the 20 days, you're over the risk. Can you get this virus to you? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Uh, there have been a few instances where it appears that people got reinfected. They think there's some immunity, but they don't know for sure how long it might last. Uh, I've heard something over the weekend that was suggesting something like six or seven months, maybe for sure. Again. But there did seem to be uh, not long term. Long, long term. Yeah, you know, we're only we're like December to months. March out from this right now, so I suspect the answers to what good answers to questions like that may come a little bit more time. Dr. Campbell, what are your suggestions for us here locally? I mean, do you have any suggestions on what we need to be doing differently or better or what we need to do? I, I mean, personally, I think, um, like I've said, given the vulnerability of many people in our communities and given that we're all on this planet and this community together and given our healthcare resources to address it, the more we can implement those mitigation steps early, the better our whole community will be. So, uh, you know, I guess we're aggressively trying to identify cases and contacts of cases that to re to contain it. But I feel like it's not a matter of if it comes; it's a matter of when it comes. And when it comes, having it as late as possible and as tapped down as much in terms of the number of cases per day or per week. When you see these numbers that go up by dozens overnight, you know, I think that's really concerning to me. And so limiting you know, group meetings and having people call in the meetings, looking at how we do business, uh, you know, is there, a, is there another way to, um, you know, and health departments, we're changing how we do operations in terms of having fewer people in the waiting rooms. I've noticed in uh, some of the parking lots of some of the grocery stores, getting people to go to the store, stock up for a couple of weeks so you don't have to go back as much. You know, uh, stock up your everything, your whatever you take for your medications, ask your insurance company to get permission to let them cover uh, an extra month so you can have a, high, a better supply at home so you don't have to get out as often. I think those are all steps we can do just to limit how much we're out in the community. I think um, travel is hard. Um, I think if you're an employer and you have employees that are contemplating trips that are high risk, I think it was this weekend, Colorado issued a, a hot alert, a health alert from CDC that goes off on their phones all over the country, that if you were leaving four county ski resorts in Colorado, that they should all be quarantined, anybody who had been there. 
<clears throat> so I would say if I were an employer and I had employees that were contemplating trips, you know, that were might be high risk, that I would have a conversation or a work policy that would say, if you're on a cruise and there's a COVID-19 case confirmed on your cruise, when you get back, you can't come to work for 14 days. You need to stay home and isolate. And that way they know it before they leave. Uh, so they can be prepared and they can decide if this is really a trip that they want to take. Uh, you know, I think just thinking through the what ifs, you know, what if you have an office with five or six people and a couple of them take a trip and come back and they've been exposed and they're going to come to work and expose the other three or four you have in your office coming to work without, you know, and I think letting people know kind of where you're thinking, what you're thinking and how you're going to protect yourself and the other people that they work with and the people they go home to, frankly, you know, by asking them to, uh, you know, maybe postpone these kind of things. That would be my suggestion, I feel like, um, postponing trips and postponing large events. And, you know, we've got wedding season coming up. My, we just said, uh, I mean, we have funerals and things like that. Those are hard. But having folks, um, Stagger those visitations so fewer people can come in, or you know, postponing weddings, postponing senior trips, postponing prom, because we're still in the middle of this. I think for our community's benefit, those are all things that we should take into consideration. Jeremy, do you and Scotty have anything you want to say or ask? Or? All right, all. We just been monitoring the situation just like everybody else. I think all across the area. I think they're screening people as they come into the jail for fever and symptoms. And uh, then I know I, I spoke last week with Richmond to speak to the State Department of Corrections because we have several large uh, state DSC facilities as well as one federal one in Lee County. And as of Friday and Saturday, they stopped. They had this turnover of prisoners where they would send them from one to another. And I asked that they stop in our area anyway, just because of what I've said in the last hour. We've got vulnerable people. We've got no health care system to maintain, to take care of these folks. And we don't need people transferred into our prisons from yeah. places where there's high rates of infection. We want, And they, I've been told that that has stopped as of Saturday. Are you in contact with the local hospitals? I don't know if that overlaps your role. It, well, I am, but I haven't been as much this week. Who reviews them on their procedures and how they adapt to this? I couldn't hear the first part. Who, who looked over how they go over these procedures are, with their nurses and health? Yeah, they, they have their own emergency operations plan, and they are part of the first Southwest Hospital uh, coalition. Now it's like 11 it's hospitals that are uh, part of that. And they get here and review their plans. So we attend those meetings. You were, I don't know if you were, but Delilah goes to those meetings. But is anyone going down to where it's actually no. done and making sure those people doing it know what they're doing? I haven't personally done that, but I think, uh, you know, Dan. Dan. Okay, yeah. Someone is doing uh, I'll talk to you in a minute. Yeah, not from my shop. But, uh, there is a, a hospital group that's monitoring the hospitals. I noticed you gave out this handout right here on tablet chlorination. Uh, is that available or do you know? That came, uh, that came from uh, air maintenance. maintenance crew here. Okay. That's a I know this is used that's in restaurants. So I didn't know if you had provided this, but you have not. So you don't know if this is a, these tablets are available to our custodians, and because everything is. That's an area. I mean, what we recommended for custodians is that these EPA designated antivirals. We do not ask them to mix up their own. If you're using it to clean uh, light switches and doorknobs and handles and things like that, that uh, for cleaning purposes, there are EPA certified antiviral uh, disinfectant that there's a list of them on the VDH website yeah to choose one from that that in the past they had asked people to mix Clorox 1 to 10 but you know I would say at this point in time I would not want to risk somebody miscalculating or running out of the you know I just get them something that all they have to do is spray it on and it's 
ready to go. But I don't. I'm not. I haven't seen that. So I'm not really sure. So, do do our custodians and, and so forth have access to tablet cleaning or well, what do you use? Tablet cleaner and bleach. Bleach, but you you do have to, as you know, in restaurants you have to have test. Are you giving guidance to the schools that are going around? I think they're having a work day tomorrow, is it? They're going to clean all the schools. I, I've talked to the schools in several counties already, and one of the things I would face in groups like this is that for many, many years, and you know, custodians and managers have not had the respect that they deserve. And if there's ever a time that this, you know, mitigating the effects of this, it is. There's a lot on the shoulders of the folks who. Are, cleaning our facilities. Mm -hmm. And so I've advocated for changing their names to environmental technicians or something yeah. and giving them a raise if you've got the money. But honestly, they are critical, really critical to stopping this and I using, agree. having what they need and having the certified cleaners that are going to take care of this and the respect that they need and the appreciation for their work of the value of their work you can huge at this point because Definitely we can all get end. it by opening that door over there, that handle on the door because it's closed now and somebody's got to be the first one to touch it and open it unless you're like me and I've learned how to do a lot of things. Yeah, they can't in the grocery store without touching yeah, anything. Uh, but uh, there really is, uh, this came, actually this came from a meeting I went to with the CDC in uh, Hazard, Kentucky about a month ago, two months ago. Because we also have a bacterial infection in eastern Kentucky that's resistant to most antibiotics. That's the most, uh, the CDC had a team there. It was <coughs> very concerning. It's resistant to every antibiotic. And there have been two or three cases that were in Kentucky hospitals that came back to long term care facilities in Southwest Virginia, not in Virginia County, but nearby. And so they had a meeting over there trying to figure out what to do about this. And one of the things they suggested, this is not my original idea, was to <coughs> elevate. The position of the people who are cleaning ambulances and hospital rooms and uh, that particular bacteria they were able to culture off of patient chairs in the hospital rooms for seven months after mm. Yeah. Mm. and so uh you know they were the ones who suggested renaming the position and making them part of our team and stopping the spread of this disease because they really really are important to doing that so has our school made any contact with you on how to, to properly clean the schools? Not with me personally. I've talked to them Don't about you some think other they things. should? Well, there's an list of EPA certified approved cleaners. So if they just pick from that list and then go through the school, there's guidance up there for schools and child care facilities. So it's out there. All they need we to do is. We have a few examples here for you, but yeah. Yeah, this one is, do you have one here for schools? I didn't bring it for schools, I brought a few for faith-based. Well, um, I'm sure they have documentation. This is online and one in here for schools and then there's another link to all the EPA certified products that at this point in time I would say they're worth it. You know, then you don't have to risk, you know, having, having it mixed incorrectly or not having enough and just going with what you have. Just, and wearing gloves and Honestly, our environmental technicians in our communities and in our buildings are critical. We have our lady who cleans uh, the one health department I was in in Wise and here to there just, she's, her whole job right now is the front door, cleaning it throughout the day and we took all the toys out of the waiting room because you can't keep up with that and, uh, you know, giving out pins so they can keep them. We don't want them back. Uh, going to clipboards that are plastic that they can wipe them down between patients. So it's just thinking of every little surface that you touch. They were able, there was a study over the weekend, and Dr. Fauci, who's amazing, uh, commented on it that stainless steel and glass and cardboard, they could culture the virus for up to three days on those surfaces. Now, the question about how viable it is after it's set on cardboard for three days came up. One of the questions I got from one of the schools was if they're sending these paper packets home with the kids who don't have internet, you know, if it lives on cardboard for three days, would it live on paper? And I just said, just don't touch it for 72 hours. When you get them back, 
leave him in the box for three days and then get him out. So he lethal, He's okay. not really sure. Fauci wasn't sure. Again, we don't know what the infectious load is for this. We don't know how many virus particles it takes to make you sick. We know that viruses like norovirus only take 10. It's really infectious. We don't know about this one, you know, and we don't know if it's day one hour from the time it landed on there. It's probably more infectious than, you know, 35 hours later. So there's just so much we don't know. But I think being careful and keeping the surfaces clean and um, not handling stuff that we don't have to. <laughs> Richie, do you have anything? This is our emergency uh, management coordinator. I've got a few questions. Okay. Uh, in Southwest Virginia, I know the Dixon County, our COPD cases are probably more prevalent than anywhere in the state, which makes our population a little more vulnerable. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned the PPE earlier, personal protective equipment, not uh, being able to get it. Uh, for our first responders, do you, do you have any idea of how long it's going to be before that comes to market? I'm sure they've ramped up the production. I've heard they have. I don't have any idea. The CDC did put out interim guidance late last week about uh, what to do when you can't get N95 masks for EMS workers, and it was put the mask, the surgical mask on the patient and then them wear a mask themselves so that you try to reduce the droplet generation from the patient and block it from getting to you. And uh, they felt like that was a reasonable thing to do until you can get more N95s. I did talk to Greg, or we were talking to Greg Woods over at EMS Council. I, I don't know if you had a chance to call him and ask him if he could buy three or four of those. Uh, I just spoke with Greg on the way over here. Okay. And he actually has two people in his office that are doing testing on that. They do. Okay. He's having problems getting the solutions, and I told him that we may be able to work out okay. some because we have some of the solution. The state office of EMS is working on getting um, some of the masks from the um, strategic national stockpile, so they'll find the kinds of masks for EMS and for public health yes. from the SNS. Yeah. But we don't know the time frame on that. Another question I have is. Uh, you were talking about the pandemic uh, plan. Mm -hmm. Does the health department uh, have any templates to uh, assist the local emergency management? With CDC the has a template. The plan? Yeah, the CDC had a template out there because year when we this came up ten years ago with H one N one, there was one for businesses, there was one for there were different templates for different types of needs. So I would Google. CDC pandemic plans and see if they still have a, t a template there. We have to update ours every year, but it's for public health, so it'd probably be different. I have some huh? Richard, I'll get you a, I'll get you a link. No, but I thought be they have them for, I know, I remember businesses, because we worked with a lot of businesses that didn't have a plan, and they probably still don't. There's several. You mentioned our best defense against this, of course, was hand washing. We, we put that out. Uh, don't touch your face, don't use telephone, all this stuff. Is the, is the health department offering outreach material or just printable material online? Yeah, pretty much what we have so far is uh, links to printable material online. Yeah. And we have Facebook and social media stuff that Dan's printing for people that, so liking our Facebook and then sharing it can put it out to some of your folks that are following you uh, with some of that information. That's what I've been doing with this sharing the yeah, good. Yeah. Um, also, another last question I have. Um, you talked about our hospitals not having the ICU capabilities with our one hospital in Richmond County. Mm -hmm. We know it doesn't have an ICU. If there is a nationwide pandemic and, and an area like ours is affected heavily, is, is there a plan in place for the National Guard to come in and assist with medical facilities? Um, I haven't. I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Uh, I mean, I know that they have that capability, and we also have how many? Five or seven? Six, seven five. We have five plus which are stabilization and treatment in place. The ones we set up at RAM that are heated and actually can generate negative pressure in them. Uh, they have plumbing and lights and floor, and they're mobile hospitals. Uh, that uh, now you have a building and you have a hospital. And that's probably you know what you need, but you need the National Guard to come in. Um, 
I would say, you know, we should look at that and, and lobby for that if we needed it. I've called up the National Guard one time in my 27 years here when there was no water, and we had them pumping water out of the Powell River and treating it in a big treat water, portable water treatment plant that we put on the tennis court and storing it in 20,000 gallon blivets and then pumping it around the town to keep it for three and a half months. So when we need to, I think those are resources that we need to be prepared to ask for and demand. Mm -hmm. Just yes, the attack. You, you described what the EMS guys are supposed to do. They're supposed to put the mask on the person first. Mm -hmm. Hand them a surgical mask, or if they're not able to put it on them, then put it, you know, help them put it on themselves. As, and you would maybe have your mask on as you're, you know, That's going into the thinking. house. Yeah, if you're going I would in. think you'd already have yours on. Yeah, you, you should. Okay, uh, yeah. I wanted to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Okay. If I could interject We have asked that all of the dispatchers screen the calls. This has That's already been out. That once a call goes into the 911 center, that they're pre screening the calls if the patient has a call for fever or if they've been exposed to anyone that may. So the personnel knows before they so go they, in. That's so good. your dispatch yeah. would know to screen the calls. That would be the dispatch we live. Yeah. Y'all yeah. yeah. have what you need, Jeremy? I mean, if you did get. So that has been yeah. in place. Deputy's got everything. Yeah. Go with it. We decided to be CDC compliant today, so we limited this room to 50. We, right. we set up a, a satellite room where the feed went to. Good. So we've got a few folks down there, and I had two questions that came from Thank that you. room. So uh, first is, in the event of a disaster, DSS is required to open an emergency shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, any idea how many people can be maintained in a shelter? And, if so, and if, once we have that number, will we be able to get everyone tested? The, the people who stay there, plus I guess also the workers. What? So I'm not sure about the testing in a shelter because you wouldn't normally just test people because they're in a shelter. Right. So you would test sick people. You would test anybody who looks sick, fever, cough, shortness of breath, and you wouldn't put them in a shelter with 50 other people. Right. What right. I was talking to other communities about doing is identifying a motel somewhere that perhaps if they can't isolate at home, so. First choice is isolating at home, and so if they're if they're febrile and or have a cough and shortness of breath, and you think that they may have COVID-19, then you want to test them. And until while you're waiting on those test results, you want them to be isolated. And so most folks should be able to isolate at home, and that means isolated, not to go anywhere. And making the social services and other folks may need to step up and help make sure if they've got groceries or need a pharmacy run or personal hygiene products or whatever that. That's a locality responsibility to help make sure that somebody in isolation or quarantine doesn't have to get out for things like that. But uh, if we're doing a mass shelter, you know, then, I mean, I would use stip tents, I think, first. Or you could talk about uh, a motel with individual rooms that have ductless air conditioning units so it's not recirculated to other rooms, just directly vented to the outside. And using some of those under, if you declared a local emergency, you would, you would have resources then available to help reimburse you for the cost of something like that. And put your sick people in some place like that if they can't go home and isolate at home. And then your shelters, I would try to limit, you know, again, to the 50 people and screen them frequently. So you wouldn't let anybody in there who needed to be tested. Right. You'd, if they need to be tested, they shouldn't even go in there until you know they're negative. And, you know, and then you'd screen them periodically while they're so, there. So you suggest that our court, I know you asked that to our sheriff, but anybody entering the courthouse to be screened by temperature or? Well, I don't, you know, we met with some other courts and they were talking about how crowded the courts were. So trying to separate their docket so they don't have so many people there at once. I was in a courthouse with at least 100 people today. Yeah, uh, so trying to limit that. And then we did talk about screening them before they came into the court building. And if they had a fever or were observed to be coughing or short of breath, that you call up and see if you can't get that case continued for a couple of weeks and send them home until you see whether they get better or not. You don't have sick people standing in the courtroom with 100 people for several hours, and you can't stay six feet away from everybody in that setting. 
I don't know how they resolved it at the meeting in Wise when they were uh, met with the judges and some of the court staff over there. But it's similar comments when they said they stand shoulder to shoulder, mm -hmm. standing room only for hours. And so. And we have one other question. Um, the county operates a food bank and we will serve roughly 800 people per month. Uh, that doesn't seem like the, an optimal situation, but what precautions could we take and should we actually close it as normal operations and do food deliveries instead of having people come to the food bank? So they, they come and they're served meals there or they, they come and they pick, come up, and they pick, pick up, up their food? They pick up like or groceries and non-perishables and those okay. type items. Well, other than, uh, and this is one food bank for the entire county. Mm -hmm. So going community to community, you'd have fewer people at each site. If you took the food to a location in Haifa and one in Clinchco and one in Clintwood and one up on one of the ridges, would that work? I would think about things like divide it, divide it up you right. know, until you don't have all those people coming to one place at the same time. Yeah, instead of going door to door with every individual one, I mean, that'd be great if you can do it, but if you don't have the resources to do that, you know, dividing it up a little bit four way. Yeah, um, I like, actually, I like that idea. Yes, sir. I've got to go back to the question on the shelter. I sense by what you were saying, you don't envision a shelter because you should isolate at home. I, and I'm thinking that our shelter would become a hospital yeah. if it became. Yeah. So I wanted to mention that. Well, I mean, the, is, what, what can it, the time when you may need a shelter day. is if your hospital's full. And, yeah. there's, and the hospital's full in Norton and the hospital's full in Pikeville. Or if the National Guard came in with a medical team, you yeah. wouldn't have to have a place to set them up. Yeah, yeah. Well, the question I think was more directed. Let's just say we have a flood during the during the pandemic. Oh, oh, okay. Then you have displaced people from their homes. Yeah, And I think you, I still think your answer is correct. Yeah, you screen people before in a shelter to keep it. So I worked the shelter at the Kingsport Civic Center a few years ago after Hurricane Ike, and we had people coming up from Louisiana that stopped. Some of them stopped in Nashville. Some stopped in Knoxville. In the last third of them, several hundred. Delilah and I did that, uh, and they were all screened as they came in. And we, I have developed a screening questionnaire for that purpose, because we also have had folks here who ended up who were supposed to get dialysis, and the person got confused and forgot to tell anybody they were supposed to get dialysis, or came without their oxygen, and they got hypoxic and forgot to tell anybody they needed oxygen. So we've got a one-page form to screen people who come to shelters to ask them if they're being treated for any infectious disease, have they had a fever, or headache, cough, are they, what meds are they on, do they need oxygen, do they need dialysis, have they had surgery. We had one person in a shelter here back in the snowstorm of 2009 who had, it was in Dickinson County, who had just gotten out of the hospital early after surgery to get home and then got home and there was no electricity and water and went to the shelter. We don't want people to do that, but mm -hmm. so we have some experience with disaster shelters under adverse circumstances and have come up with some screening forms. Yeah. Sir? There must be a, a, a shelter like you're talking about, then not, it is not required to have a registered nurse there to it is not. No. We, there aren't enough registered nurses to go around. We have nurses from public health and some of our MRC partners but most of the time, our MRC partners are not able to respond because they're affected by the same whatever it is, flood or snowstorm. But uh, so our, we don't have enough public, we have one public health nurse in Dickinson County. So we've had more than one shelter open. And so we're available on call. But people, shelters are really in design for people to have a place, a roof over their head and some help to eat. But it's not a hospital where your meds are passed. If you're taking your meds on your own at home, you should bring your meds and take your own meds at the shelter. Uh, now we have a few people who are, you know, elderly and not able to do that without assistance. And sometimes after the worst happens, if it's a flood or if it's a snowstorm, and we can move them to a medically fragile shelter. But what we learned in 2009 was that it was about three days before anybody could move anywhere. And so we had medically fragile people everywhere. And uh, so eventually we got them concentrated in one medically fragile shelter where we could staff it a little better with, with people for their oxygen and their meds. But initially it's, you know, if you give your own meds at home, you should bring them and plan on giving them yourself. There's no medical 
at a general shelter, there's no medical services. Well, no, they, they get placed by now because we offer the offer and shelter at one point in time to the women. Uh -huh. Because uh, I was told that we didn't do it actually because we'd have to have registered nurses. Uh, we don't open shelters. That's DSS's job to decide when a shelter opens, and we just support them. But, uh, you know, there are some risks involved if you've got medically fragile people there. <laughs> Thanks. Huh? Food inspection. Yeah, we do an environmental health inspection of shelters, too, to make sure there's adequate mm -hmm. hand-washing restrooms and that food that's served there has refrigeration and heating capabilities, too. Hey, you go yes, sir. I find that what I'm hearing a lot from folks that they're ready to shell at these stores because in their mind that they're believing that there is some type of mandatory quarantine by the National Guard or U.S. military. What's the likelihood of this? I don't know. I mean, it depends on how bad this gets. I mean, that happened in Italy, right? And it happened in China. So I don't have, I don't know. Follow-up question on the shelters. If this, uh, just for instance, if it did get that bad in our area, and you have to take something like the motel that has a uh, room to room ventilation, uh, you're going to have two, two waves or two stages there. You're going to have people that are really sick and you're going to have people that's getting better. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I mean, you, there's going to have to be a separation point somewhere in there. And if they're all in the same place, that's going to be pretty hard to do. Uh, yeah, if they're recovering from the same illness, at least you don't have to worry about them getting infected with it. But you're right, I mean, it'll be a challenge. There's no question that this is not going to be easy. And that's why I think that everything we can do now to mitigate this is really, really important to do now. I know we've got a federal declaration and we've got a state declaration. Has there been any resources made available as a result of that? that would get from the state or the federal? State? I've heard that because of the state and the federal, there are, there was what, 50? There's money coming. I don't. Million. Yeah, and I don't understand how that rolls down, but it does come once there's been a declaration of an emergency. Then there is, re we're having to all of our people are having to track their time, that's overtime that's spent on this, so that if there's eligibility for reimbursing folks, I mean none of us are, you know, but there we have nurses that may be called out that, you know, with the understanding that there is money for things like that. And there will be money, as I understand it, to do things like reimburse for the cost of these motels if we needed to do that, or reimburse for the cost of furnishing food to people that are in isolation or quarantine if we need to do that. That's my understanding of how that money is to be used, as well as used for vaccine development, and PPE. Yeah. By the end of this thing, I know we're just in the starting phases of the pandemic. You know, we've not reached the middle ground yet. But uh, I was wondering about the state and federal money, about maybe like the county purchasing uh, the easy thermometer where you just can't touch into somebody's head for the different departments. Mm -hmm. I just talked about the board. Right. I have that there. Yeah. And, you know, Right. Yeah. And I think generally what I've in past experience with floods and things, you once the declaration is made, you know the money will come and you just track all your expenses and then at some point when it's over you submit them. And then we submit ours locally up to Richmond and then they get submitted and then they a few months later, maybe a year later, you get reimbursed. So it's not real time money to take to spend on this. You have to spend upfront money and then Track it and submit it and get reimbursed. Do you think we'll have to meet the twelve million dollar FEMA threshold to be reimbursed for expenses, or will it be? I do not know. I mean, I can't imagine that locality by locality and localities like the eight that I have here would have to hit a twelve million dollar threshold each. Well, they would put them each. The twelve million dollar threshold is statewide. Statewide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. I have one more question. The mask you can see people wear on TV, doesn't it have to be a certain type of mask to be effective, or is it one you can buy from Rite Aid or whatever? Well, it depends on who the people are you're seeing, but if you're talking about the N95 yes, mask, uh -huh. okay. 
then there are different manufacturers of N95 masks and different styles and different sizes. And so you have to be, you have to have a medical clearance to wear that. It really increases your work of breathing, especially if you wear it for an hour or longer. And so people with heart disease or lung disease can't wear it more than, can't wear it at all, some of them. And some of them really can't wear it long because it, so you, there's a medical question. So let me back up one point. So you have to have a respiratory protection plan. Whoever you work for has to have a written respiratory protection plan that says here are the people who we've identified who we think need to have PPE and be trained to put it on and take it off correctly without infecting themselves. And then there's a medical questionnaire. It's in the OSHA 1910, CFR 42, 1910, the standard respiratory standard. And it's a long questionnaire that asks you about underlying lung disease and your overall health and a bunch of questions. That has to be signed off by a clinician, a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a PA that says you're okay to work in a N95 mask. And then once you get your respiratory protection plan from whoever you're working with and you have your medical clearance, then you get fit tested to try to find a mask that actually fits and protects you because everybody's face is here. If you have facial hair, you're not going to get fit tested. You have to wear a positive air purifying respirator because you can't fit test people with any kind of facial hair. Uh, but you get fit tested based on yeah, their sizes and different one. manufacturers. Yeah, so so uh, these people you see walking around with masks that you can buy, they're worthless they're if you haven't been fit tested. So and they're you don't wasting have the N95, them. And they're wasting them and keeping people who could really benefit from them from having them. So they don't need to do I mean, that. Everybody you look on TV, they've all got these masks on. Well, if it's just a surgical mask, then, you know, it's probably not going to help them too no, much. Not, it's not effective. But right. if, it, if it's a surgical mask, it can reduce their exposure to droplets. But if it's an N95 mask, if you've not had the medical questionnaire, you've not been fit tested, it's a waste of money and a okay, waste of a resource. The use of gloves, too. If you, if you use the same pair of gloves all day long, then you're... You're not protected. doing anything. To well, and the trick is taking them off without, you know, without, once you get the first one off, you pinch it with your gloved this hand and you pinch it on the outside and pull it off. But then you want, this is your clean hand now, so you want to make sure that you stick your fingers under the inside of this glove to pull it off so that you are on the clean side and not just pull it off with your hands on the dirty side. So, you know, and taking your mask off, you take your mask off while you still got your gloves on. So there's tricks. And you wash your hands to put it before you put another pair of gloves yeah. on. You wash them when you take them off, you wash them before you put another so pair of gloves on. It gives people a false sense of security if they're wearing gloves, the same yeah. pair of gloves all day long. Well, I promised Scott County I would be down there at 3.30. <laughs> so Thank I need you. to be hitting the road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item five, consideration of the interim guidance and operations for our employees here in Dickinson County. Has everybody got a chance to look at that? And I appreciate David for sharing that and getting that together. Does anybody have any questions on that? Or, you know, Bud got how we need. I, I spoke with Bud this morning. He had no issues with us. How do you phrase it? Or well, actually, I've, I've got, I kind of wrote a little statement which sort of summarizes this. What will happen after we pass know. this? I don't know. I did it right here. We will send a copy to all of our agents. I guess I heard it on the road. And we will also post it on the website for the public to view it. Okay. So do we want to just adopt it as a... As a Plan this this would be more like a uh, working document that we can attend. If I can get get a little bit of quiet, we've got business here to take up, please, so we can talk. Thank you. It'll be more of a working document. We've not really ever been in this situation before. Uh, I don't think we are at any type of resolution phase, but I do think that we're going to have policies that we need to consider, and that will alter schedules and. So this needs to be sort of the framework that later if things get worse and we have to do closures and, and that type of thing, we instead of redoing the document, we just put an addendum to it and move on. Does anybody have any questions or anything to add on that? Will we have our meeting next week, do we? As far as I know, we're going to be... Well, that's still up in the air very much. But we are what well, part of this is... Well, let me, just, that, let me right? just read this. I, this Go is, ahead. This will be the summary of sort of what's in front of us. Uh, 
course, we heard from our friends at the health department that we need to be in what we'll call community mitigation mode, where we're trying to minimize our exposures. We're trying to stay ahead of the curve. So in an effort to do that, Dickinson County will issue this document to be used as a framework for preparation and response to the coronavirus. This document will be shared by email with all employees and posted on the county website and pushed to social media for the public to view and to share. Know that we continue to stay up to date with all the latest guidelines, information from the federal government, the CDC, the Virginia Department of Health, VDM, our regional and county EMS uh, folks, and the Office of the Governor of Virginia. Uh, as we learn of new information, it requires us to make schedule, facility, service alterations, or cancellations. We'll keep you apprised immediately by our website, which then pushes to social media. Uh, the general highlights of this is last week our employees were notified of all the CDC and VDH guidelines for trying to uh, keep themselves and our workplaces safer, which involved the high hand hygiene, social distancing, travel restrictions, and stay home if you or any family member are ill. We ask that the public follow the same practices. Uh, most known cases are mild and only take a few weeks of recovery, but if you suspect you're sick, we ask that you contact your local health department or your personal health care provider on how to get screened for testing because as you heard today, the testing process is really where we're lacking in this country right now, and there is a screening process before you can even be tested. Uh, as far as our facilities, we operate three main buildings, the Judicial Center, the Courthouse, and the Deeser. We regularly sanitize those, but in the wake of this, we have upped our sanitization to three times per week per building. Uh, we also are offering the service of sanitation of buildings to all of our other agencies and, and other folks. The school division already has their own uh, machines for sanitization, but if they needed our assistance, we would gladly oblige. In addition to these measures, we have each individual office cleaning and sanitizing their doorknobs, workstations, and other high traffic areas and their spaces at least twice a day. For now, we anticipate county offices to remain open on regular schedule, but that could change depending upon circumstances. If hours are altered or offices closed, we're trying to follow directives from the governor and our health agencies. Our current plan, even in the event of closures, is to keep all essential function of government active, but if conditions worsen or warrant and we have to make changes, uh, these could include some suspension of services, and that mainly applies to office stuff and for the pickup of trash. Uh, I have spoken to the town of Clintwood. They have a meeting tomorrow. Our intent at this point is to continue all of our, providing all of our services, but there is a point if this got bad enough that we might have to consider a suspension, but we of course will keep everybody advised. Uh, in the event that we have to close our office buildings, we ask the public to call or contact the office needing services from so that you can make alternate arrangements to assist you. I spoke with the treasurer this morning. They are more than willing to work with people whether they need to make payments and do things by mail or can do online services. We have that ability with several of our other offices. So in the event that you have business but we have had to close, we may still be able to help you. Uh, the county will adhere to the current CDC request that no congregations of larger than 50 be allowed. If that threshold is lowered or even eliminated, we will have to automatically comply. Our current plan is to continue our, our board supervisor public meetings and workshop schedule, but that could change depending on future circumstances. And if we are forced to close our public meetings, which would require the issue of a state mandate by our governor, uh, we will continue to live stream any meetings so that we can keep information flowing to the public. Absolutely. Um, I know several states have already kind of done an, a governor mandate exemption for the public, for the rules that govern public meetings uh, because they are required, of course, to be open. But in the event of this pandemic, it is possible the governor could allow us to hold public meetings, but they actually be closed as long as we tell about it. So that's sort of the highlights of this document. Would people, would citizens be able to call in? We would work on the process to have the interaction because the one thing that the live stream would not take into account is the ability for, yeah, you know, 
that. Like a text we'll have to see text. how that works out. We Again, we've never been in this circumstance, uh, but yes, I would think that we can set up something where we could have that capability. To address a question from the citizens who yes. know they were here. Yes. David, do we need to adopt number five, or is it just... Uh, I actually think it would be a good idea if just to buy like a total voice okay. vote. Everybody is supportive of this measure. I'll make uh, a motion that we adopt those uh, interim guidance that you just read. Have a motion to hear second. I second. Uh, all those in favor of adopting the uh, interim guidelines uh, as proposed by the county administrator, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye is well. And I appreciate again, I said it, but I appreciate David being on top of that and, and organizing this meeting. Uh, does any board member have any? I know we don't have it necessarily on a piece, but does anybody have anything they want to say or before we adjourn? Uh, just want the public to know and everybody that's watching uh, the, the board office phone number is 926 1676. The non emergency sheriff's office number is 926 1600. The Department of Social Services number is 926-1663. Those are the three numbers as this thing progresses to keep in mind if you need any assistance. Uh, again, our your board is on top of this and we're doing as much as we can do right now. There's unfortunately as much unknown as there is known, but we are trying our best to make sure Dickinson County uh, people and families are protected and we're doing what we can to protect our county employees too. So uh, thank you all for coming. If nobody else has any. Let's go ahead. 1661, I'm sorry. 1663 is a number, though, isn't it? I'm sorry. 1661 for the Department of Social Services is the main number. Thank you. Uh, this time, I guess I'll entertain you. I'll make a motion. I think. Yes, sir, Trap. Yes. Well, that's one thing. I'm going to make sure you all are protected in all this, just like everybody else. And, and do you have everything you need, glove wise? And, I think it's important that the I think if, it's important that the you, garbage is picked up. If you find you have anything you're lacking, you uh, let, let us, us know, please. Cindy, me or Cindy know, and we'll take care of it for you. you. Don't want we you all are, we want you all protected, and and you know, if we do close, I, I imagine we'll be. We'll you have need to, a class we'll on how to properly use out. gloves? I'm not sure yet. Okay. So we'll we'll Why would you be surprised people don't use gloves? gloves? If your guys would like them, we will definitely supply those. We yeah, have help whatever you need, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I don't, I'm sure. We're doing our best if any employee wants some form of protective gear, whether it be mask, gloves, we're, we're working to provide those. And if there's anything you guys in particular need beyond that, we're more than happy to work with appreciate you all. Before I came up to the meeting, uh, one of our suppliers for EMS to check on gloves and stuff, they do have some gloves, because I ordered two cases while I was sitting on the parking lot right now, Governor, and extra, and I ordered shields, but shields, right? They have no gowns, they have just a few hoods, they said, and the N95 masks, they have none. And we've been asking our emergency responders and work with Richie, anything that we can do to help you guys. We want you all to be safe because you're going to be front line Absolutely. with it if things happen. And that goes, Jeremy, that goes for your staff as well. And for your town, for your towns, we, we you will be included in anything that we are offering to do. Appreciate it. Sure thing. And, and Adam, i not going to forget you. Uh, one, one thing I'd like just to, uh, to see if the county would consider uh, reaching out to some of these uh, bigger companies about like cleaning supplies. I mean, we're, I know we're already looking to start to run short, and you sure can't buy them you know, from Walmart and stuff now. Well, we are checking all of our resources because we buy things from probably 10 or 12 different vendors, and we are working with all of them. But there's just right now, there's a shortage. And it's been created by this fire storm of people that have gone out and bought things I in abundance. Each of his main. But that's I can assure you, way. we're, we're yeah. doing everything you we can, can get to other find things, but that's if, if you, as an agency, can't find it, and we can help out, we'll be glad to let you know. Just let, just always contact us if there's something. Is that it you in like. the store? Can you buy a bunch? Of Walmart had plenty of bleach last Friday. I was up there. That's basically all they had left. 
I buy bleach for I buy anything um, else. This is one of those times. No That's the best is, just to pick up the reeds. And the cheapest. And the cheapest. But they, they had it at Walmart. If you can't sanitize your office, can give us a call. Give David a call. And, and Food City had bleach. David. Walmart and stuff was out of bleach all yesterday. There's no more sanitizing wine. That was as a lead yesterday. They had bleach today. They had bleach fried on that. They did have some. Well, generic's the same. Yeah. Anything uh, else? Anybody? It's the same uh, amount of hydrochloric. Yeah. Uh, no, anything no, else? I entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. Uh, Would you leave the law? Second it. All those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 I also will be uh, adjourned. Aye. Thank you.